Hi, this is Dr. Donald Pelto. Uh, welcome to the plantar fasciitis uh, audio version of this book. And uh, we're going to look here uh, and read this book uh, for you. If you want to get a digital download of this book, you can go to drpelto.com, D-R-P-E-L-T-O.com. So let's look here, the plantar fasciitis book. Uh, the copyright is 2019. All rights are reserved. No part of this book shall be reproduced or transmitted in any form by any means, electronic, mechanical, magnetic photography, including photocopying, recording, or by any information storage or retrieval system without written prior permission of the publisher. No patent is assumed with respect to the information contained here. Although every precaution has been taken in preparation of this book, the publisher and author assume no responsibility for errors or omissions. Neither is any liability assumed for damages resulting from the use of the information contained herein. Requesting permission to make copies of the part of the work should be mailed to permissions. Dr. Donald Pelto, DPM, Central Massachusetts Podiatry, 299 Lincoln Street, Suite 202, in Worcester, Mass., 01605, USA. The contents include introduction, plantar fasciitis, what is plantar fasciitis, symptoms of plantar fasciitis, the plantar fasciitis scorecard, causes of plantar fasciitis, diagnosis, plantar fasciitis treatment evaluator, treatment categories, reduce inflammation, reduce tightness, stabilization, foot and reduce pressure, surgical options, preventing plantar fasciitis, video explanation, online product recommendations, Amazon, plantar fasciitis treatment checklist, frequently asked questions, and additional resources. Introduction. Thank you for your interest in the plantar fasciitis book. This book is tended to help provide further education to you about plantar fasciitis. By no means do we believe this book takes the place of visiting the office. However, if you, it can be of good use as a reference source for information about treatments that can begin at home and what treatments are used in the office setting. This book is set up with different sections and online resources and videos that can be helpful to the recovery from plantar fasciitis. You can view each of these resources by clicking the accompanying link. These are the same resources that I give to my patients in the office. If you are a visual learner, I will recommend starting by watching this video explanation of plantar fasciitis. This will help you better understand this book. The video is 27 minutes. Click here to watch the video. To your health, Dr. Donald Pelto. To download this video, go to drpelto.com and click on the plantar fasciitis book to view the contents and the downloads. Plantar fasciitis. What is plantar fasciitis? Heel pain is most often caused by a problem called plantar fasciitis. This can also be termed heel spur syndrome, where a spur is present on x-ray evaluation. Heel pain can also be due to other causes, such as a stress fracture, tendinitis, arthritis, nerve irritation, or even a bone cyst. Since there are many probable causes, it is essential to have the heel pain properly diagnosed. Symptoms of plantar fasciitis. The most common symptoms of plantar fasciitis are pain on the bottom of the heel, pain first thing in the morning when getting out of bed, pain that increases over a period of time. People with plantar fasciitis often describe the pain as severe upon rising in the morning and then improving as they become more active during the day. After they sit down and relax, their pain is lessened until they begin moving again. After walking for a few minutes, the pain decreases because they are stretching the plantar fascia. For other people, the pain is worse when they are on their feet for longer periods of time. The plantar fasciitis scorecard. To help you better understand the symptoms, I have put together a plantar fasciitis scorecard. To use the scorecard, read each of the items on the column on the left and rank your, system, your symptoms and give it a score. All the scores you have on the right column and read the information below. The plantar, plantar fasciitis scorecard. Number one, severity of symptoms. I don't have any pain with my plantar fasciitis at this time, one, two, and three. I have pain when I do extended periods of standing and walking, but besides that, I don't have any daily pain. The next, seven, eight, or nine, I have pain daily when walking and standing. And 10, 11, and 12, I have pain all the time when standing and walking, despite all treatments, and it even hurts when sitting down. The reason I made this scorecard is it, because it can help with evaluating plantar fasciitis, okay? And so this may be easier if you're dealing with these symptoms. The length of symptoms, 
I've had symptoms for a, a few days to a week, but they have gone away. Four, five, and six, I've had symptoms for a week to a month. Seven, eight, nine, I've had symptoms for one to six months. And 10, 11, 12, I've had symptoms between one and two years. Morning pain. I don't have any pain when getting up in the morning. Four, five, and six, I have occasional pain to the heel when getting up in the morning, but it goes away after a few minutes. Seven, eight, nine, I have pain every day when I get up in the morning or after sitting and driving, but it goes away. 10, 11, 12, I have pain every day when I get up and the pain does not go away at all unless I am sitting down. Scorecard number four, effects on lifestyle. My plantar fasciitis does not affect my lifestyle. I can do anything that I want. I'm very active. That's one, two, or three. Four, five, or six, I only notice my heel pain when I'm walking uh, and for longer periods of exercising, but I can push through it. Seven, eight, or nine, I have pain daily, but I can still work and do my daily activities. 10, 11, 12, all I can think about is pain. My work is affected because of constant pain and I stopped working out. Weight gain and activity level. I have no weight gain and no change in my activity level with plantar fasciitis. Four, five, and six, I've gained a few pounds and I'm exercising less due to my heel pain. Seven, eight, and nine, I've gained five to 10 pounds and my activity level is greatly reduced, but I am still able to do my work and walk around. 11, 12, 13, I can't do anything because of my heel pain and I have gained over 20 pounds since my symptoms began. Question six, understanding about plantar fasciitis. One, two, and three, I am interested in learning about my condition and I regularly seek my doctor for treatment. Four, five, and six, I have a good grasp about what causes plantar fasciitis and I am eager to learn more about the condition. Seven, eight, and nine, I have Googled my condition and talked to some people about my plantar fasciitis. 10, 11, 12, I'm not interested in learning about my condition and think my doctor should be able to do everything. Question seven, effects on attitude. I have no problem and I, feel, and I don't feel like my plantar fasciitis affects my attitude. Four, five, and six, I have a few bad days because of my heel pain, but I am hopeful the symptoms will get better with time. Seven, eight, and nine, I am aggravated at how long I am having my symptoms despite actively trying to get better. 10, 11, 12, I feel depressed because of how debilitating my plantar fasciitis is, and I am not sure what to do to get better. Question eight, shoe gear. I can do a barefoot and wear my shoes that I want without any problems. Four, five, and six, I feel better with shoes that are more supportive. Seven, eight, nine, when I am barefoot, I have pain, but as long as I have shoes on, I feel better and I can be more active. And 10, 11, 12, I have pain with shoes and without shoes, there is nothing that is comfortable for me. Next, we're going to look at the scoring system. If you've scored 0 to 24, you probably don't have a problem with plantar fasciitis at this time, but you may have a problem in the past. You don't need any treatment, but would benefit from wearing supportive shoes, as well as from foam rolling on your own. 25 to 48, you have mild symptoms of plantar fasciitis. You may be able to treat this on your own with some of the home therapies or treatments recommended below. If the pain becomes worse or more bothersome, you should probably get help from a podiatrist to help with this condition. 49 to 72, you have severe symptoms and are probably already getting treatment. If you are not receiving treatment, you would benefit from treatment to help resolve your symptoms more quickly. The information below will help you start on your treatment before seeking professional advice. 73 to 96, you have very severe plantar fasciitis and you need help urgently. You may have other conditions along with plantar fasciitis as well and should seek out help from a professional. You may be a con candidate for advanced therapies, treatments, or surgery. Causes of plantar fasciitis. The most common cause of plantar fasciitis is too much motion in your foot causing excess pulling on the fascia. The plantar fascia is a ligament-like structure that courses from the heel to the ball of your foot. When your foot has too much motion, there is excess pull on the fascia causing it to become inflamed. Feet that are overly flat, pronated, or have too much of an arch are likely to develop plantar fasciitis. Also, an overly tight Achilles tendon, equinus, in the back of your leg will cause excess tightness on the structures on the bottom of your foot. If you imagine two ropes pulling on the heel bone, the bottom one is the plantar fascia and the top one is the Achilles tendon. If the Achilles tendon is pulling up, the plantar fascia will naturally become tighter, making it more prone to injury. 
Wearing non-supportive footwear on hard, flat surfaces puts an abnormal amount of strain on the plantar fascia. It can also lead to plantar fasciitis. This is especially true for those who wear flip-flops over extended periods of time and for those who have a job that requires long hours on their feet. Obesity can be a can, can also contribute to plantar fasciitis. And here we see a question, what is plantar fasciitis, with a picture of an Achilles tendon pulling in the back of the heel and on the bottom of the heel. Diagnosis. To properly evaluate heel pain, a complete medical history and examination of your foot and lower extremity mechanics is necessary. This will require an evaluation of your walking, gait, and possible video or photography of your feet. By doing this, we are able to rule out all of the possible causes of plantar fasciitis. Also, diagnostic imaging, such as an x-ray, ultrasound, bone scan, and magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, may be used to distinguish among different types of heel pain. Sometimes x-rays can reveal heel spurs with people with plantar fasciitis. However, these are rarely a source of pain. Image 1, x-ray of heel spur. And then image 2, an ultrasound of plantar fascia showing thickness increased on the left side. Image three, MRI of plantar fascia showing thickening and inflammation. Plantar fasciitis treatment evaluator. Here is the plantar fasciitis treatment evaluator I put together that evaluates the different treatments based on the type of treatment, reducing inflammation, reducing tightness, stabilizing the foot, and reducing pressure, and effectiveness of treatment. This is essential because many people who read about different treatments think that they all have a similar effectiveness, which is incorrect. Obviously, icing is not as effective as a cortisone injection, yet they both work at reducing inflammation. Similarly, supportive shoes is not as effective as a custom orthotic at stabilizing your foot. However, when wading through the material that presented either online or by your physician, you have difficulty determining what treatment to try first. I hope you find the plantar fasciitis treatment evaluator helpful in determining the best type of treatment for your plantar fascia. The following resources are in order of effectiveness based on the table below. The plantar fasciitis treatment evaluator. On the left side, you can see effect into scale five, or on the top is most effective, then goes down to four, and then three is moderately effective, two, and then one is least effective. On the top, you're gonna to see reducing inflammation. The most effective is gonna be stated first. Cortisone injection, then shockwave therapy, amniotic membrane therapy, steroid anti-inflammatory medications such as prednisone, oral non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, Motrin ibuprofen, icing and contrast bath, platelet-rich plasma, topical pain reduction creams such as Voltaren. Then reducing tightness, top is physical therapy, home therapy foam rolling stick and TP tools, stretching, night splint, Strasbourg sock. Next is stabilizing foot and reducing pressure, top is custom orthotics, walking boot, over-the-counter arch support, supportive shoes, strapping of foot, padding, compression sleeves, losing weight. Treatment categories. There are numerous treatment options for plantar fasciitis. These are divided into different categories based on the purpose of the treatment. There are three purposes of treatment. Reducing inflammation. These treatments focus on reducing the inflammation that is the main reason for pain you are feeling. If you do not reduce the inflammation, you may continue to limp and walk differently, which can cause pain to other parts of your body or your foot. Reducing tightness. This is focused on reducing tightness of the fascia on the bottom of the foot, but more importantly, reducing tightness to the muscles that are on the back of the leg that insert either in the heel region or in the foot. This is the most misunderstood reason for plantar fasciitis. Stabilizing foot and reducing pressure. Stabilizing the foot is essential to allow your foot to work better. If you have a foot that is flat or pronated, it becomes unstable. As a result, the muscles in the foot and the back of the leg region have to work harder. The more stable your foot becomes, the less work you have to put into walking and being active. Reducing pressure is the least important aspect of the treatment, in my opinion. If you have plantar fasciitis in only one foot and they both have the same pressure on them, why don't they both hurt the same? Reducing the pressure can help initially, but only if there is inflammation, as mentioned in item number one. But once the inflammation is improved, there is less of a need to reduce the pressure on the heel region. After each treatment, you'll find an explanation of the treatment as well as the pros and cons of each treatment to help you better decide what is the best for you. Reducing inflammation. Cortisone injection. 
Many times a cortisone injection can help reduce the inflammation and pain around the plantar fascia. Here is a document about information after steroid injections. If you have any questions, click to see the document. This can be found on drpelto.com under the plantar fasciitis book. This and all future other reference material to uh, a linked document to this PDF. Pros. For patients that can resolve the issue of plantar fasciitis very quickly and min minimize additional treatments. Cons, usually you can only have three injections per year, and these injections can weaken the fashion as well and can delay the use of other treatments such as EPAT because of the effects on inflammation. A picture of a cortisone injection into the plantar fascia. Shockwave therapy. EPAT. This is a non-invasive surgical procedure that uses high-intensity sound waves to break up adhesions on the plantar fascia and to help activate your body's healing response. The benefits of the procedure is that there is less needed time off of work following the procedure. Uh, here you can watch a video about the treatment, and if you'd like to read more about the treatment, there's some information on the website that has a link as well. The pros to shockwave therapy. You can avoid having a cortisone injection and may resolve the heel pain, and there are no side effects with this treatment. Some of the cons, sometimes it can it is not powerful enough to reduce inflammation and can be painful for some patients. Usually it's not a covered procedure by most insurance plans. Here's a picture of shockwave therapy. Amniotic membrane therapy. This is an injection that is done under ultrasound guidance into the area of maximal pain and inflammation. This therapy uses amniotic cells to help regulate inflammation in the body. To learn more, you can find a link on drpelto.com under the plantar fasciitis book. To watch a video about this treatment, you can go there. The pros, this is a good alternative to surgery and can greatly reduce inflammation naturally. The cons, usually is not covered by insurance and most uh, treatment. Medications, oral anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs, such as ibuprofen, may help reduce pain and inflammation. Also, there are steroid-type medications such as prednisone that can help reduce inflammation. The pros, these can help reduce inflammation for lower pain level and inflammation. The cons, some people cannot take them due to stomach issues and they can cause other health conditions if taken long-term. As well, they are not as effective as cortisone injections. Icing, putting an ice pack on your heel for 10 minutes a few times a day helps reduce inflammation. An easy method of icing is using a frozen water bottle to massage the bottom of your foot. If you'd like to learn more about how to properly ice, uh, you can go find this document on drpelto.com under the plantar fasciitis book. Pros, this is easy to do. Uh, this is easy to do on the foot and heel region. Cons, many people find it less effective than a cortisone injection and tends to make the area feel better only while icing. For more long-standing plantar fasciitis uh, or more severe symptoms, it's less helpful. Contrast baths. Another way to reduce inflammation is to switch from a bucket of cold water to hot water, and this can help reduce the inflammation. Switch from one basin to another every five minutes ending in the cold. If you'd like to learn more information, you can find a document online. Pros, this can help reset the pain signals in your foot and ankle by causing vasoconstriction and vasodilation. That means opening and closing of the blood vessels in the foot, and this can help reduce swelling and pain. The cons, it's a little time consuming. Platelet-rich plasma. The plasma portion of our natural body has many healing components, and this procedure uses a patient's own blood in a concentrated form and injects it into the area of injury on the fascia. Following the procedure, the patient is immobilized in a removable walking cast and needs minimal time of work. The pros, it uses your own blood platelets to reduce inflammation. The cons, it's expensive and there's conflicting research about the treatment's effectiveness. Topical pain creams, there are many compounded creams that are available to help with reducing pain and inflammation. Some are purchased over the counter and others are prescribed. The pros, they do not involve any medications taken by mouth or injection, but the cons is that, are that these topical creams are usually the least effective if you have much pain with your plantar fasciitis. Next, we're going to look at how to reduce the tightness. Uh, physical therapy. When stretching alone is not enough, either home physical therapy t tools or physical therapy evaluation may be beneficial. Uh, if you'd like to see what the Graston tool looks like, uh, there's an example online, and it is recommended doing this. Uh, it's not recommended doing this on your own, but have a trained professional work with this type of a treatment. The pros, most patients who have physical therapy get better quicker, and people are more consistent at doing home exercises with a therapist due to the accountability. The cons, there are some, though, that don't get better with physical therapy, and it also can be inexpensive if you have a high deductible plan. And you'll also see a picture here of uh, someone using the Graston technique. 
Trigger point. Deep tissue, deep tissue massage using trigger point tools is a dynamic treatment option when compared to static stretching exercises. The basis is on reducing soft tissue adhesions to the muscles in the back of the leg and can lead to heel pain. The treatment can be done in the convenience of your home with quick results. The pros, it's effective if used at home and if used properly, it works better if you track your home therapy. The cons, you need to be motivated to use them and make sure you learn to use them correctly. It's still not as good as physical therapy in terms of effectiveness. There are here a few videos that you can find and also locations to purchase the trigger point tools online. Example of trigger point tools and then another example of how to do foam rolling and then an example of using a stick. These are all uh, options for doing home therapy. Stretching exercises. Exercises that stretch out the calf muscle and the plantar fascia can help ease the pain and assist with recovery. Here's a video that will explain and demonstrate some of the common stretches that are used for plantar fasciitis. However, I prefer the deep tissue massage tools over stretching that are described later in this book. Uh, click here to watch a video of stretching. Uh, the pros, it's easy to do anywhere without any tools. The cons, many people stretch incorrectly. It can overstretch, causing more problems. Less effective than physical therapy as well and other tools that are used. Here's some examples of stretching exercises. Night split. Wearing a night splint allows you to passively stretch your plantar fascia and calf muscles while sleeping. This can help reduce morning pain experienced by some patients. This is effective treatment when using non -custom, uh, with non-custom orthotics to prevent foot flattening pronation while in the night splint. Uh, you can see an example here on Amazon. Uh, this is very helpful for morning pain with the first step out of bed in the morning. The cons, if you are a belly sleeper, this may not work for you. And also for some patients that cannot tolerate it the whole night and end up removing it in the middle of the night. There's another way to use this brace is at the end of the day while watching TV at night. There is another type of splint called an anterior night splint that goes in the front of the foot that may work better as well if you sleep on your stomach. Or, uh, sorry, if, if, if you, it, it works for some people. The Strasbourg sock. Uh, this type of treatment is similar uh, to a night splint, but it holds your foot in dorsiflexed or upward position while sleeping. And for some people, this is more comfortable than the night splint. You can see an example here with this link. It's similar to the night splint, that's the pro, and it can help with the first uh, pain, step pain in the morning. The cons, it can cause some people toe numbness for those that use it uh, because of the pulling up of the toes. Also, this pulls in the toes, and it, it doesn't do a good job at dorsiflexing the whole foot for some patients. Next, we're going to look at the category of stabilizing your foot and reducing pressure. Uh, the best way is with custom orthotic devices. Custom orthotic devices are specially molded to your foot to help correct the underlying structure abnormality causing the plantar fasciitis. These are used to support the arch region, but more importantly, they are used to correct the heel alignment. As you can see with the picture below, the heel position is more aligned after the orthotics are placed on the patient. The big difference between inserts you purchase at the stores is that they do not correct the heel position as well as custom made device. However, a custom orthotic can be five to 10 times more expensive than an over-the-counter device. The pros, if made correctly for your condition, it can reduce pain, but also prevent recurrence of the condition. Custom orthotics usually last five to 10 years, much longer than shoes or inserts. The cons, if this is not, not fit or made to your foot, you may not be able to wear the device. Many times these custom orthotics can take weeks to break in and feel uncomfortable. You may need to wear a less supportive shoe due to all the support in the orthotic. Uh, many times custom orthotics are not covered by insurance and can cost between $300 and $600. Removable walking boot. In more severe cases, wearing a walking cast boot for a few weeks can allow your foot to rest and heal. This boot, boot can help your foot muscles and tendons on the back of the calf region. If you want to see what it looks like, you can go to Amazon and also something called an even up is here. The pros, the boot is easy to wear and can make you slow down if you are very active. It is not made to wear for long periods of time, but many people can help can get great help with the pain. You can't drive with a boot if it's your right foot that's injured and the boot has a, a little lift to it and sometimes you need another device called an even up to make the, the foot the same height. Uh, the even up is worn on the non-injured foot over your shoe to bring you to the same height as the boot. Or you may prefer to wear a shoe with a heel so that you do not develop other knee, hip, or back pain when wearing the boot. Arch supports. 
Over-the-counter arch supports are non-specific to your foot type. Similar to over-the-counter eyeglasses, they may help some people and are a good place to start treating heel pain. Keep in mind that unless you have new supportive shoes, arch supports will not help. One type that is quite rigid and helpful is an A-line orthotic. You can see it on Amazon. The pros, it's less expensive than a custom orthotic, and for many people, they can give sufficient support to help them with the peel pain. Uh, the cons, they're, sometimes they're very rigid, and some people uh, find that the foot that's inflamed uh, can be uncomfortable. These are not custom orthotics, so if you have much pronation or your heel is tilted, they do not correct the foot as much as custom orthotics. Good shoes, wearing supportive shoes that have good arch supports and a slightly raised heel can help reduce the stress on the plantar fasciitis. When buying shoes, they should be comfortable the moment you buy them and make sure you shop for shoes at the end of the day when your feet are the largest or more swollen. A good shoe that is popular now is a Hoka shoe that has extra cushion to the bottom of the foot. If you'd like to see them, there's a link to Amazon on the website. There are many shoes that are marked to be for plantar fasciitis and this is only marketing. If you have quite a bit of pain and no shoe is comfortable, buying another one will probably not help or solve the problem. You should focus more on reducing the inflammation with other treatments explained elsewhere in this book. The pros. These types of shoes are very supportive. They have great stability and cushion, and many times they are very comfortable. People find them comfortable. They are, the cons is that they are higher up, and some people who wear these have some balance issues. These are specific to the Hoka shoes. Avoid going barefoot and wearing flip-flops without support. When you walk without shoes, you put undue strain and stress on the plantar fascia. It's best to have a flip-flop, if you're going to wear them, with good support. Uh, there's an example here on Amazon of one of these called the UFOs. The pros, uh, these are offer more support to the arch region than a traditional flip-flop, and the cons is that the flip-flops that are more supportive usually don't uh, look as good as the other ones. Uh, strapping is the next one. This consists of place padding on the, with, with tape on the bottom of your foot to help support the foot and reduce strain on the plantar fasciitis. Sometimes this can be used with um, a, a special tape called KT tape. Uh, here's an example of tape that will work well for strapping your foot. You can find this on Amazon and also if you'd like to learn how, I included another video explanation of how to do this. The pros, this can help support your foot and reduce pain by increasing support. The cons, this is cumbersome to do uh, on your own and makes it difficult to shower when you have this on. Uh, next is padding. An air cast air heel can pad uh, and can placed under the heel to help minimize the pain but correction of the mechanical abnormality is still necessary. I don't recommend simply using an insert made out of gel or just a cushion. It may make your feel, feel, foot better in, a, in the short term, but it doesn't provide any correction uh, for the long term. The pros of this, if it works well uh, and you have a lot of heel pain, it can help uh, to help reduce the inflammation. The cons is that this is usually not worn long term uh, and the other treatments are more beneficial. Compression sleeves. Many people with plantar fasciitis feel better with additional compression on the foot. This is similar, but not exactly the same as taping the foot. There are compression sleeves that work very well for this. Click here to learn about compression sleeves. There's some examples. Uh, these can offer support, uh, similarly to strapping as noted before, and they can be removed and placed on again. Uh, the cons, they can be a little expensive and bothersome because they are very tight. Now, losing weight, uh, reducing extra pounds will help decre decrease the strain on the plantar fasciitis. Uh, many people come in the office with plantar fasciitis because they are exercising to lose weight. There is a new concept I'm sharing with many of my patients called intermittent fasting. If you'd like to learn more about this weight loss method, here's a book I recommend uh, you can find here. And also there's an interview I did on a patient that's lost over 60 pounds using intermittent fasting. The pros, this can help in general and will reduce the pressure on your feet, but weight loss is rarely the cure for plantar fasciitis. The cons to weight loss, none. Uh, surgical options. Uh, although most patients with plantar fasciitis respond well to non-surgical treatments, a small percentage of patients may require more advanced or surgical treatments. If after many months of conservative therapy, you continue to have pain, these are the other options that can be considered. Uh, endoscopic plantar fasciitis, this is a procedure that uses a small incision to identify and then surgically cut a portion of the plantar fascia to help relieve the pain. The pros, it's a smaller incision and quicker recovery. The cons, sometimes you can have nerve injury with this. Uh, and sometimes it does not resolve the problem of the plantar fascial pain. 
uh, open plantar fasciotomy. This procedure is similar to the one above, except that it uses a larger incision. The pros, it's easier to see the fascia and cut through the portion of the fascia. The cons, it's a larger incision, usually a little longer for recovery, sometimes does not resolve the problems of the fascia. Now talking about preventing plantar fasciitis, no matter what type of treatment is used to treat plantar fasciitis, the underlying cause that led to the condition may remain. Therefore, you will need to continue with preventative measures such as soft tissue work to the back of the calf region, supportive shoes, and custom orthotic device for long-term treatment of plantar fasciitis. Recurrence is common, especially when using cortisone injections if no other treatment is done. The cortisone injection can reduce the inflammation temporarily, but if no treatment is used, the inflammation can quickly return. Uh, video explanation. Here's an overview video that is recorded about plantar fasciitis. This will go over the same treatment options that are given in this book. And also you'll find on the bottom of this video uh, another playlist of other videos about plantar fasciitis to learn more. Online product recommendations from Amazon. Uh, here's a list of products that I recommend for my patients if they have plantar fasciitis. You may be unable to come to the office, but you will find this recommendation page the most uh, up-to-date treatment options for treating your own plantar fasciitis. Click here for recommendations. Once again, these are online things that we talked about in the book. You may need to see a doctor, but if there's no doctor available uh, or you want to try things on your own, you can try some of these products. A plantar fasciitis treatment checklist. Uh, here's a checklist you can use with your doctor to go over the different treatment options for treating your plantar fasciitis. Uh, these are used really to go over the treatments that the patients are doing. So imaging, have you had an x-ray, a diagnostic ultrasound, or an MRI? Traditional treatments, uh, reducing inflammation, uh, categories icing, anti-inflammatories, contrast baths, cortisone injections. I put eight weeks there because that's the period of time I like to do between cortisone injections, uh, walking boot, uh, shockwave therapy or EPAT, hydrocision, Tenjet, which is a newer type of a, a treatment we didn't include in this book, a amnio injection, uh, next category, reducing tightness, uh, stretching with foam rolling, or some of the other tools, physical therapy and home therapy, night splint, or something called a Dyna splint, uh, stabilizing the heel with a foot support, uh, supportive shoes, custom orthotics, heel cup, compression sleeve, and then if it's been over 12 months, considering surgery or a second opinion. Some of the frequently asked questions I get, do I need orthotics to get rid of plantar fasciitis? The answer to that, each patient is different, and even though your pain may subside, the mechanical instability and excess movement of the foot that caused the problem may still need to be addressed. Using supportive shoes and orthotics are very effective at controlling the foot motion. Will I need surgery for plantar fasciitis? The answer, most of our patients do not uh, need advance that advance to surgery due to the plantar fasciitis. However, if you've been treated for over six months to a year, then some surgical options may be considered. When should I seek treatment for my plantar fasciitis? Since there are so many home treatments to try, that is a good place to start. However, keep in mind that seeing a doctor can help you get better faster than on your own. If you have it for over a month and it's not improving with the home treatments, then it's best to make an appointment. And how do I reduce the pain that I have in the morning when getting up? The best way to reduce the pain in the morning when getting up is to either sleep with a night splint, uh, on your leg or stretch with a towel for a few minutes before getting out of bed. Finally, you can put on a shoe or a sandal first thing out of bed to reduce the pain when getting out of bed. I've also included some additional resources. Here are some additional resources that are credible to help with treating plantar fasciitis. It's from the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons, a publication that will be included uh, called The Diagnosis and Treatment of Heel Pain. So that's the end of the book. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, all this can be find, found on drpelto.com, and you can see there's a, a link for the plantar fasciitis book with all these resources there for you to enjoy. And you can also download a PDF or if you'd like to purchase the uh, book on Amazon uh, as a Kindle version or as well uh, in a print version if that's easier for you to read. Hope you enjoy this. If you have any questions, please let me know. My email is don at centralmasspodiatry.com if you have any comments. Thank you.